Uh, good afternoon, I'm Aaron Burstein, and I am actually going to hand the introduction off to our senior associate here at Kelly Dry, Jason Lewis, who is going to introduce this afternoon's webinar. Uh, Jason, please take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jason Lewis. I'm an associate in the Privacy and Advertising Practice Groups here at Kelly Dry. Um, and I'll be your host today for um, today's uh, webinar on recent privacy developments at the FTC um, and predictions for the upcoming year. Um, CLE credit um, is available for this web webinar, and um, we'll read that code off towards the end of today's session. Um, but to jump right in, um, I have with me today um, Aaron uh, Bernstein and Jessica Rich, um, two, um, two of my colleagues here at Kelly Dry, and I'll turn it over to them right now to, to introduce themselves. Hello. Well, I'll go first. Um, I'm Jessica, and my name is uh, claim to fame until I got to Kelly Dry uh, was that I spent 26 years at the FTC, the last four as its uh, director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection, overseeing uh, all of the consumer protection work at the agency, including privacy. Um, before that, I was the first and longtime manager of the FTC's privacy program. And I also ran for a time the uh, agency's division of financial practices and held some other uh, positions at the agency. I am delighted to be here today talking about two of my favorite topics, privacy and the FTC, with uh, my former and uh, my former and current colleague Aaron and my new colleague Jason. Uh, thanks, Jessica. It's great to be here today with you and Jason and um, all of our guests. As Jessica mentioned, I'm, I'm Aaron Burstein. I'm a partner in the privacy and advertising law group at Kelly Dry. Um, I did get to know Jessica <clears throat> while I was an attorney advisor to Commissioner Julie Brill at the FTC and actually knew Jessica before that when I was um, working on uh, the Obama administration's privacy, uh, so-called white paper and green paper um, back in the earlier part of the last decade. So I've known Jessica for uh, quite some time before she joined us at Kelly Dry. Um, I think we have a lot of material to get through, lots of developments at the FTC um, in privacy land. So um, I think let's let's go ahead and jump into the substance. Great. So I guess to start, um, you know, I think the big picture is a good place to start. So Lena Khan was just appointed as uh, the FTC chair back in June of 2021. Um, so Jessica and Aaron, can you tell us about her priorities and goals um, in privacy specifically? So I'll jump in and Aaron will, of course, um, uh, provide excellent um, ad additions. Um, so um, just to start big picture, um, Khan has laid out a very ambitious agenda for the agency, including as to privacy, in a series of policy statements and speeches. Um, First, um, she's made clear that she views prior FTCs as too weak and wants to turn the page and take a very different approach. Um, one thing she says she'll do is look at issues, including privacy from a dual competition and consumer protection perspective. Remember her background is competition. Um, examining the effects, not just on consumers, but on market players and market power. Um, consistent with that, uh, she plans to focus on the tech platforms and other gatekeepers in the marketplace. She also wants to protect workers and small businesses, not just consumers in a traditional sense. In addition, she has said she wants to focus on FTC rules and rulemaking, not so much whack-a-mole enforcement, as she called it in one of her policy statements, of course, rules enable the agency to affect more systematic change to whole sectors or markets. Uh, and they also enable the FTC to get monetary relief in, uh, in cases. So th those are some of the reasons that uh, rules are such a priority. Um, uh, in this area, as we'll discuss in a moment, Khan contemplates not just more rule enforcement, but also updates to existing rules and also new rules to limit uh, what's being called commercial surveillance. Um, 
And then finally, I'll add, Khan has said she will, uh, the FTC will, will, will seek stronger relief in its enforcement actions and settlements, including data deletion, stricter consumer notice and consent requirements, bans on conduct and individual liability. So that's just an overview. Yeah, that's a, a great overview. And I think that it, it lines up with uh, Chair Khan's background, which is primarily as an academic. Um, many of you might know that she is a professor at Columbia Law School and one doesn't arrive at that position by by thinking small. Um, you know, professors at at uh, law schools tend to take on very big challenges and and see large issues and focus on systemic types of uh, changes or corrections. And I think what uh, Chair Khan published really as a law student um, uh, several years ago fits that mold of sort of thinking, you know, in in the paper she published and sort of uh, became famous for the uh, course of antitrust doctrine over the past several decades had taken one wrong turn after another had focused on the wrong standards the right the, the wrong types of harm and really needs to be rethought so i think that sort of um uh forceful and really far-reaching analysis of uh, the issues that we're facing or that the FTC is facing is part of the perspective that she brings as the chair of the agency. Um, in addition to that, I, I, I think there's some continuity between her and Commissioner Chopra, who left the agency um, toward the end of 2021 to become director of the CFPB, but there's continuity in um, perspective and continuity in some key personnel within the agency. Um, Commissioner Chopra, when he was at the FTC, took very strong views on the issues that Jessica teed up as part of, of Chair Khan's agenda, seeking stronger remedies, um, really taking a, a broader approach, using rulemaking authority to address consumer protection and privacy issues um, specifically. All of this is happening against a backdrop of a variety of uh, legal and administrative challenges that the agency is facing. First and most importantly for the focus of today's webinar, which is the FTC and privacy, um, we don't have a comprehensive federal privacy law. Um, that's not news to anyone here, but it is important in terms of understanding the obstacles that the FTC is facing in um, pursuing what I would say is more the traditional lines of enforcement under Section 5 of the FTC Act, and also helps to explain some of the agency's focus over the last year or so on other authorities, other sources of authority that it has, um, either under more specific sectoral statutes or existing rules or things of that nature. Um, coupled with that, uh, lack of a comprehensive privacy law is um, the, the, the loss that the FTC suffered in the Supreme Court last year um, with the AMG case, uh, where the Supreme Court held that, that the FTC you know, does not have the authority to um, obtain equitable monetary relief. So um, ob obtaining sort of damages or, or um, uh, restitution for consumers if they suffer financial harm and also lacks civil penalty authority for first offenses of section five so um, that has much broader implications for the agency but it also comes into um, into effect and comes becomes a consideration um, for privacy in particular and the um uh add to add further to what to, to what aaron just discussed um the, the, in the course of wanting to really turn the page and take a different approach, Khan is also changing the way the, the agency operates. So um, uh, one thing she's done is she's beefed up her, the staff in her office uh, and a lot of decisions are being made from there. Uh, and there's a lot of technologists in her office now. It's a much bigger office than the chairman's office have tr has traditionally done. Um, she's 
uh, stop doing, you know, she's told staff to stop doing speeches because she feels like that is a way that, that the st the ch charitably, <laughs> she feels that's a way, um, you know, this, the staff gets off message and may get too cozy with particular uh, groups, um, in her view, industry groups. Um, and, you know, she's generally putting staff on a short leash. Um, and she's also uh, been happy to proceed 3-2 when she had a, 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 a full commission in contrast to the agency's somewhat bipartisan uh, uh, traditions. Um, this is of course proved difficult now that um, Bedoya is, is not confirmed and, and Chopra left. So now it's 2-2 two, two, and that really affects the agency's current agenda. And Erin, what do you think about the open meetings? That's another change that she's made. Uh, well, definitely a departure from um, FTC tradition. Uh, you know, I, I think they're, they, they have benefits and, and drawbacks. I, I do think it's um, healthy for agencies in general as sort of, you know, good government to have public meetings and, and have discussion. Uh, I, I think that a drawback is that they can become forums for posturing. Uh, and, you know, I think the dynamics still are, have a little bit to unfold. Um, you know, they're, they're serving some purpose of giving public airing to, um, to issues and allowing uh, members of the public to speak if, if they want to. But in terms of, of you know, really advancing um, policy initiatives and advancing the work that goes into some of these very broad, very ambitious goals that Chair Khan has set, a lot of that still happens behind the scenes. And I think that's a broader consideration that I have in my mind, uh, you know, having been in the government for a while is a question is always, who's going to do the work? How's it going to get done? What are the timelines? And, um, you know, that, uh, that all, all of these projects start to stack up pretty quickly in terms of the resources that they consume. Um, but Jessica, you know, you were at the FTC with, with, without really many public meetings. Um, so I'd be interested in your perspective as well. I think that the uh, well, first you just you just touched on a really important point, which is resources. So the FTC, you know, has this bold agenda, but it still is the little FTC we 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 know. So and it didn't get those additional resources and build back better. So uh, it's going to be hard to get you know a, a huge amount done along the lines that have been laid out. But in terms of the open meetings, I actually think it's a good idea, but. I don't think that it's, it's as transparent as has been built because documents aren't circulated till afterwards. Um, the, 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 the Republican commissioners are claiming they're not getting the documents in advance at all, you know, and, and so there's a certain amount of theater to it. But I think the idea of it is, is good and, and um, people have a chance to stand up and, and talk. So it, it, maybe they'll be able to make it work better as we move forward. Uh, you know, if they spend a huge amount of time preparing for those meetings as opposed to doing the work, which is something you were sort of getting at too, that that isn't great either. Um, so, you know, thank you, Aaron and Jessica, for that um, sort of high level overview. Um, so I think, you know, it might be helpful to drill down on some of these issues a bit. So, um, so you know, Khan wants to focus on enforcement and rulemaking, right? So um, what has the FTC done um, here and uh, what's in the pipeline? Well, uh, so the, the, the pipeline is a, a long one and it, it begins further back in the past um, with, with Chair Khan's predecessors and the previous FTC. Um, you know, I think one of the big items that, that we're watching and which has been in the pipeline for quite some time is uh, COPPA rule revisions, so Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. The 
first step in that direction occurred in July 2019. And that was actually a little bit ahead of schedule for when the copper rule was up for um, for its 10 year review, you know, sort of indicating that the importance of children's privacy issues, um, the changes in technology since the last rule was issued and, and went into effect in 2013 had become significant and, and uh, suggested that speeding up the review schedule was um, was a worthwhile priority. Uh, when the FTC initiated that review, there was a request for comments. Um, they held a workshop in October of 2019. And since then, um, really nothing has happened on the rule review front as far as what we can see publicly. Part of that may be due to certainly the, the, the pandemic, which altered how resources were being allocated and, and really also, I think, changed the way that um, children and technology were, were interacting. And one of the issues that the FTC asked about in the 2019 request for comments was about ed tech, educational technology. Um, certainly, uh, it magnified in importance since then. So, you know, it would not be surprising if part of what's happening is, is an examination of, um, of those issues. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're still waiting for a rule proposal or, or um, something concrete to sort of see how the FTC would contemplate changing um, the, the copper rule. In the meantime, we have seen several enforcement actions uh, in the last year or so that focus on COPPA, um, and there's a pretty steady drumbeat of, of political um, interest in children's privacy issues, uh, letters from the Hill on a variety of fronts, as well as legislation, which we'll talk about a little bit later in today's session. But just to kind of flag a couple of, of actions that have come out recently and illustrate this point of the FTC, you know, looking at all of its authorities and enforcement actions. The first example I wanted to highlight is uh, the OpenX case, which was announced in the middle of December. Um, OpenX is an ad network, and the FTC's complaint alleges really two things that, that OpenX did wrong. One of them really didn't have to do with COPPA at all, but was about the alleged practice of collecting um, uh, Wi-Fi access point identifiers to really convert those into location information um, where users of apps that included this advertising um, software had opted out of location information collection. That's something that is uh, within the purview of Section 5. It was a deception claim um, and, you know, was in one perspective on things really kind of the, the meat of the case. But there was also a COPPA count uh, that was included in the OpenX complaint. And really that focused on the uh, practices within the company of looking at apps that were using the software, um, reviewing them to see if they uh, were child directed. And what the FTC faulted <clears throat> OpenX for was you know, being too narrow in the view of what was a child-directed app and only looking for primarily child-directed apps as opposed to things that might uh, attract a, a, a mixed audience. So, you know, this th these were pretty separate areas of conduct and I think illustrate the risk that, um, you know, what might start as an investigation about one type of conduct can expand, in, expand into others, particularly when um, as in this case, there's a hook to COPPA, the ability to get civil penalties, and that was, um, that was the result in this case. Let me just um, highlight one other significant step that the FTC has taken in recent months, which was to update the uh, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act safeguards rule. Um, this also was uh, a, a rule revision that 
was in the works for several years. I think the first um, notice that went out about it was in, in the fall of 2016. Um, so close to a, a five-year course to, to re, um, revise the rule. Um, and basically, you know, there are more detailed requirements in the rule for financial institutions, security programs, um, a variety of, of specific steps that institutions have to take to assess risk and measure risk and more specifics around that. Um, none of it, I think, is all that surprising given the, the detail that the FTC had been developing um, more generally in, in terms of the security programs that it has required in enforcement orders, but this is now um, a rule. Um, a lot of those provisions go into effect in December of this year, and, and so that, that was a um, substantial change that I think reflects to some extent the groundwork that the FTC had laid in um, uh, previous enforcement actions. Um, there are a, a variety of other things afoot, um, and some of them are a little bit less well developed at this point. And um, for those, let me turn things over to Jessica to give uh, maybe a little bit more of a, a preview of what, what's in the pipeline. Well, one thing was um, that I want to add to what you were just talking about is the even though it wasn't a rulemaking, it was the policy statement on the health breach notification rule, where but through a policy statement, even though the health breach notification rule was under review, the FTC basically extended this narrow rule that applies to personal health records in using that terminology, meaning you know these accounts consumers create for themselves to all health apps. So, um, um, we'll see whether they try to implement that through through a rule or whether they're satisfied that they can do it through a policy statement, but they're actively trying to get settlements based on that new interpretation. So that's, that's something really to keep an eye on. In terms of um, the, the inchoate stuff that Aaron mentioned is, is kind of in the pipeline. So, um, in, you know, for the coming year, in filings with OMB and statements since then, it was a December filing that was sort of done in the dead of night, um, the FTC says it's going to launch a series of rules under its so-called Magnuson Moss rulemaking. And uh, the one of these rules that has gotten a lot of attention is a rule to address surveillance-based business models, um, which in the filing and in statements since has been talked about as possibly not just addressing, you know, commercial surveillance as it's being called, but also lack security, algorithmic decision discrimination and potentially dark patterns too. There's a lot of issues to cram into a MAGMOS rule. Um, meanwhile, Commissioner Slaughter has given speeches about uh, enacting a data minimization rule, uh, which would, restrict data collection to uh, the data that's needed for the specific product or service requested by a customer. Uh, again, that would be under Mag Moss. And um, nothing has been launched yet in privacy, none of these rules. They've, they've actually launched two Mag Moss rules in other areas, but not in privacy, in much narrower areas. Um, because of the 2-2 two -two makeup, because the two Republican commissioners have indicated the this kind of broad privacy rule is not something they're going to support. Um, but these efforts to do a broad privacy rule has been encouraged by the White House, certain members of Congress, and a lot of advocacy groups which have filed um, petitions and support and letters with the FTC. A key challenge for the FTC here, there's, there's few key challenges. One is that the Mad Moss procedure is very cumbersome much more so than the usual APA uh, rulemaking process that um, most rules across different agencies are, are uh, promulgated under. There's many steps in the past, they've taken years to, uh, to, to enact rules, sometimes as much as nine years, many opportunities for opponents of, of the rule to lengthen and challenge the process. Um, among other things, some of the key uh, 
uh, things about MAGMOS to keep in mind is that each practice regulated in the rule must meet the legal test of deception or unfairness and be shown in the record when the rule is launched to be prevalent. So, um, well, you have to have reason to believe it's prevalent, but then when the rule is completed, you have to show prevalence for each practice in the record. So this is easier said and, than done. We all know certain things are prevalent, but documenting it um, is, is another thing. Uh, and, um, and by the way, we have a very good blog post summarizing these, these processes um, on, on the ad law access uh, and on our website. Um, and then the other thing is something uh, Aaron and I both mentioned before, which is the FTC is really constrained by resources um, for these types of activities, as well as the rest of its agenda. So to the extent that this is a really lengthy, cumbersome process that just creates even more demands on the FTC's um, limited resources. And so uh, I guess um, switching gears a bit. So um, Jessica and Aaron, what can you tell us about um, the FTC's work specifically um, around and its plan specifically around big tech platforms? Yeah, well, we've already mentioned some of the activities here. OpenX, which Aaron um, discussed, is a platform and Aaron discussed you know, that it was all about its responsibilities for entities operating on its platform. So that, that was one. Um, surveillance and dark patterns are tech issues that um, are often seen as something that's, that's particular to the platforms. Um, um, and we talked about the surveillance rule, but as, um, as to the uh, dark patterns, um, one, um, there's been a lot of talk about dark patterns and regulating dark patterns. Obviously, it can be very hard to determine what is simply, you know, an advertisement and what is the dark pattern. But um, uh, we did analyze uh, the current, um, the FTC's current state and policy statements and discussion of dark, dark patterns versus um, prior work using deception and um, and unfairness to tackle practices that trick people into making choices they wouldn't otherwise make. And so far, the kind of dark patterns that people are talking about really does fall in line with the kind of bread and butter um, deception and unfairness uh, cases the FTC has been pursuing um, for years. Um, and uh, we have a blog post on that with a lot of examples. So you might want to look at that. Um, on platforms, uh, also the FTC did two 6B studies of relevance here, or one is underway. 6B is a special tool, section 6B of the FTC Act that enables the uh, FTC to get information from companies in, in a non-enforcement context, just lots of information. Um, and uh, the first one of those was the, F this was ongoing the way Aaron talked about, this had been before Lena Khan's appointment, uh, there was a 6B on data collection by the broadband companies. And uh, that report was issued over the summer and it concluded that yes, broadband companies collect a lot of data and give consumers, you know, not a lot of options to, to stop it. But in, and there was an open meeting on this issue. And in that open meeting, the FTC clearly kicked this issue to the FCC uh, to handle. They did not indicate they were going to be pursuing it. They were sending it over to the FCC. The other big study that's going on is um, a study of the data practice of um, the social media companies and streaming video streaming services. And that will be very interesting because it's right in line with the priorities about looking at gatekeepers and platforms. And it's um, squarely within the FTC's jurisdiction uh, so we should be looking for uh, output on that one uh, soon. And then the final thing I'll mention about platforms is that um, in some of the statements and policy statements, Khan has said she wants to do additional compliance re review or even order modifications if necessary for some of the big companies that are under order with the FTC for privacy and security violations. By the way, under order from prior administrations. Um, Facebook, Google, 
Microsoft, Twitter, Uber, and others. But um, nothing is public yet here. And again, this is going to take resources to do all of that. Yeah, so I think that's that's um, a, a great overview. I think one thread that ties together some of these a little bit is is kind of the issue of um, what are a company's obligations in dealing with things at that large scale. And you see questions about this in the 6B order that went to social media and video streaming platforms. Um, you know, if you look at the, the questions on children's privacy, there are sort of specific questions about, you know, what algorithms are you using to um, monitor for child content? Um, you can sort of contrast that with the open X case where there was a manual review process and this traffic quality team was taking a look at every publisher that, that was incorporating the software. Um, I think there's, there's a real, um, tension between those approaches, questions about how, how much, uh, knowledge is too much. And this is kind of a point that Commissioner Phillips raised in his statement on the Open X case. And basically, would they have been better off if they hadn't tried to keep um, uh, child directed apps from using their software? And if they had basically avoided gaining actual knowledge um, of, of those apps. So I, th I think that type of issue gets, um, gets replicated in various ways. Um, you know, this this is definitely one of one of the challenges that the FTC faces from an enforcement and policy front. It's also kind of a day to day challenge that I think a lot of companies and and we as as um, outside counsel face of you know dealing with large scale uh, client bases or customer bases, sort of trying to strike the right balance between um, preventing unwanted conduct policing for legal or policy violations and doing that in a way that's that's workable, scalable, and doesn't um, doesn't end up creating additional risks to to uh, to businesses. Good point. Yeah. And um, Aaron, on the topic of enforcement, um, so what direction has the FTC taken so far and um, what do we think is in the pipeline? Well, the, the, the pipeline is, is hard to predict. I, I would stand by my previous statement that it, it starts with previous commissions and um, months and, and years into the past. So, uh, you know, uh, on, only time will tell uh, what enforcement actions started at some time in the past and, and eventually see a public resolution. But, you know, I think that part of, of you know what what we're seeing this is on on the more atmospheric or optical side less on the substantive side but I, you know i think some pretty um, strong messaging from the ftc on you know being able to send refunds to consumers and a consistent reinforcement of the message that the ftc now faces this uh, this challenge this hurdle this inability to recover money for consumers and that gets underscored with every refund that goes out and, and, you know, under either other authority or previous settlements that have gone through the administrative process necessary to get um, uh, refunds processed, you know, they're, they're underscoring that this was something we used to be able to do, we can't do it anymore. In, in terms of actual remedies, as, as we mentioned um, earlier, some of what we're seeing is more far reaching um, remedies. Uh, you know, in uh, the OpenX case, they're, part of what they were ordered to do was, was to delete data that had been um, collected in, in alleged violation of the law. Um, in the Ever case, Ever album, which was under the previous FTC, um, there was something similar um, that this had to do with, with an alleged misrepresentation of opt-in for facial recognition. And, you know, the FTC ordered um, the deletion of, of photos and of, of the, the models that had been developed on the basis of uh, um, 
photos collected without um, appropriate consent. So, you know, I, I guess there's a little bit of, of um, a feeling that some of what we're seeing now and, and being really emphasized by the chair and, and by, um, by Commissioner Slaughter of seeking more expansive remedies had started, um, but you know there's there's more momentum behind it right now. So um, you know those those are some of the more recent developments of what orders look like and and what some of the remedies look like under um, both the FTC Act and under more specific statutes. Um, and Jessica, I don't know if you wanted to to add anything to that. I also have a question from from the audience that I can try to uh, to address. Oh, good. Um, well, the only thing to add is that, you know, it'll be interesting to see if we get to a point where companies are pushing back in any of these cases, go to litigation, what courts order in terms of this relief, because in the, you know, it, um, during many years when I was at the FTC, we would get very strong uh, relief in settlements. Um, and you weren't always sure that a court would order the kind of relief that that you know that we that we got in the settlement in terms of injunctive relief. So um, we're early yet, and these are all settlements. So it'll be interesting to watch if if companies push back and there's litigation. And uh, we have a, a question that came in um, about children and about COPPA, and you know essentially. Um, Will, will we see the FTC try to expand um, enforcement to minors or will there be legislation that might do that? I think we'll, we'll park the legislation question for the moment, um, you know, as far as using COPPA to get there, pretty clearly it's, it's under, under 13, um, but that doesn't rule out the possibility that some of the, um, interest that the FTC is developing, uh, you know, it could be as a dark pattern or under some of the authorities that lend themselves to dark pattern like enforcement, um, whether it's Roska or plain section five, you know, might might become sources of, of enforcement authority for um, minors. So 13 plus um, year old teenagers who wouldn't ordin who wouldn't be covered by COPPA. Um, so that's one possibility. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially since um, under longstanding FTC policy, you're entitled to consider the group that's being, you know, each individual, it's, it's a reasonable consumer, but it can be a reasonable consumer within a target group, which is kids. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, about using um, its own rulemaking authority to enact protections for kids. That could be rough because COPPA specifically gives the FTC uh, authority to do rulemaking for, um, for under 13. And so it would look like uh, going around Congress. The other thing is that one of the provisions that's still in MAGMOS is pre preventing the FTC from enacting um, rules uh, uh, related to kids' private uh, kids advertising, which of course everything now is advertising, and so um, uh, using unfairness, and you know most of privacy would have to be unfairness, not deception. So that's another limitation. So I don't think uh, the FTC would be successful trying to expand COPPA using its MAGMOS authority. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Jessica. And, um, you know, I think just pulling the lens out a bit, um, you know, how are activities in the White House and Congress impacting the FTC? That's a good question. So the, the FTC is definitely getting encouragement from the White House and Congress to be aggressive on privacy. The executive order on uh, competition last July specifically uh, encouraged the FTC to do a rule on uh, privacy violations and unfair surveillance. And some members of Congress have, have also either explicitly said uh, the same or signaled the same. 
Um, now, Congress's on inaction on certain issues is also um, affecting the FTC and giving messages to the FTC. So, um, Bedoya hasn't been confirmed, so that affects the FTC because now it's 2-2 and they can't launch all these ambitious plans. Uh, as Aaron discussed, there's a long uh, standing stalemate on federal privacy law, um, which uh, uh, deprives the FTC of some of the, 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 the authority it needs in privacy, which is one of the reasons it wants to do a rule to strengthen its authority and privacy. Um, you know, in Congress, we continue to see lots of bills on targeted advertising, on kids and teens, which is a, a very, an area of great interest right now. Uh, and most recently, a 90 page bill we just saw on digital services uh, yesterday from, from uh, Congresswoman Trahan. Um, but Congress is not coalescing around priorities. Like every one of these bills sort of looks at a different part of the ecosystem and makes a different point. So we still seem to be, despite 20 years of debate, far off from a federal privacy law. Um, there was money and civil penalty authority in Build Back Better, but Build Back Better didn't pass. So the FTC didn't get those authorities. Um, and the efforts in Congress to fix the 13B problem that Aaron discussed also hasn't gotten very far. So in uh, words and deeds, Congress is very much encouraging the FTC to be aggressive, but so far it's not giving it the proper guidance and tools to do it responsibly, in my view. Aaron, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, but I, th I think a question came in that, that relates to um, the FTC trying to use its current rulemaking authority while sort of uh, being at the mercy of Congress for any additional authority. And it, it, the question is, you know, if there are new rules, whether they're under uh, the APA or, or MAGMOS, what can companies expect to have in terms of um, coming into compliance? Essentially, will there be a transition period? How, how does that typically get? Well, there's usually a uh, um, a transition period, and depending on how complex the rule is, uh, um, shorter or longer. Now, when it's a congressionally mandated rule, sometimes the uh, the mandate from Congress, the, the language from Congress, the act that Congress passed, talks about when the effective date is, you know, a year from enactment. Um, we would hope that if the FTC is successful in developing a rule of, of this mag of the magnitude it's been discussing, and we have yet to see just how broad or narrow it is, that there would be like a year implementation period. But um, but you know we don't know. We don't know. And you know I think one one point I have to add to that is that in in the safeguards rule proceeding, that was one area where um, I, th I think the FTC took comments um, primarily from industry constituents saying like you've proposed a transition period for some of these provisions um, that's that's not realistic and so a lot of them ended up with a one-year um, transition period so that's that's not to say a year is enough time or would be enough time in all cases but might indicate that where, where there's really a well-founded uh reason that what what the agency is proposing just isn't going to be sufficient um that there's there's an audience for those types of of arguments so um you know that would that would be something to look at very closely in any proposed rule i believe the blumenthal um blackburn bill that was just proposed on kids and teens i could be mixing up my bills is like an 18 month period, but I could be mixing up my bills. <laughs> and, and of course, that comes um, on top of, or well, if it were to become law, would come on top of multiple other uh, moving pieces that are that are um, on the privacy landscape at the state level. So um, that, that would certainly uh, make life more challenging for many of us. 
that's a nice transition, Aaron. Um, you know, because Jessica was just speaking about how um, you know the U.S. federal government has been impacting um, the FTC's activities. And I'm curious if you could speak to how the US states and, uh, and global um, changes and developments are impacting the FTC. Sure, so at, at the state level, um, you know, the, I get the sense that the FTC is looking closely at um, what's happening at the states in terms of regulations and enforcement um, and being vigilant about remaining a, a force in privacy enforcement. Uh, so to give one example, a lot of us know that under the CCPA, the word sale or sell is a term of art. It's defined in the statute. Um, a lot of debate occurs about you know, whether a given data flow involves the sale of information. I think from an FTC perspective, I would expect them to look at the way sales are represented in privacy notices or other consumer facing disclosures and say like, all right, we're looking at this from the standpoint of a reasonable consumer who is using this service and we're going to interpret it uh, interpret that word through that lens. So, you know, I think on the one hand, we want to be very careful about the CCPA dimensions of discussing sales, but on the other, not become so hyper technical that we lose uh, the forest for the trees and and think about it as a you know a CCPA lawyer rather than a consumer. So, so I think you know that's one point of intersection that that the FTC might maintain. Um, you know, as far as more global developments, uh, there's, it, it, we're, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern um, on the transatlantic data transfer um, debate and resolution, um, trying to reach some sort of agreement or resolution of the, the Schrems II court result that invalidated Privacy Shield, that really falls to uh, the Biden administration, um, not the FTC, to take the lead on that. There's uh, not a lot of room for maneuver because of, that's a legal holding, sort of interpreting fundamental rights at the European level. Um, what, whether or what role that would create for um, the FTC in some sort of regime beyond privacy shield or as a replacement for it. You know, I think if the structure bears any resemblance to what we've seen in the past, that would be essential. Um, but I think that's that's sort of an issue that will be addressed later on if there's a, 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 an agreement or a meeting of the minds on, you know, what are the protections that would need to be in something privacy shield like to address um, the European legal requirements for, um, for sending data under those conditions. Um, unless you have anything to add, Jessica, um, I think I'll just pose one or two more questions. Um, you know, we've talked about quite a bit here, um, and it sounds like there's a lot to keep our eyes on um, over the upcoming year. Um, and, uh, you know, I think just to sum up, what key sort of actions are you predicting for 2022? And uh, which ones do you think clients should be watching, especially closely? Aaron, why don't you go first? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, to pick up on the, the previous segment of the conversation, you know, I'll be interested to see with all of the state level privacy rulemakings that we expect to launch soon, you know, whether the FTC will, will file comments or, or otherwise play um, a role in those things. But, you know, otherwise, uh, I, I would expect maybe some, um, some gap between the broad, ambitious, bold agenda that the chair has set out and the, uh, the steps taken on the ground. You know, we talked about the copper rule. That, that is um, important. Uh, you know, a lot of 
interest from industry, from um, Congress on reassessing things. Uh, you know, I think those point to uh, certain sources of pressure to sort of indicate a direction and, and propose rule amendments and, and move the process along because, um, because that's, that's an increasingly important issue, increasingly difficult to navigate under the existing rule and, you know, would make sense um, as, as a next step. Um, so I, I would expect to see that before a, um, a serious MAGMOS effort to, to uh, regulate um, surveillance advertising or something like that. Yeah, I'm, I've got my eye on uh, Bedoya and because I think everything really, you know, they, they can do a lot. The FTC can do a lot with the four people it has, but in terms of the ambitious plans, those start when Bedoya gets there. They can't launch, um, they can continue the COPPA review, um, but if there's any divergence um, between the Republicans and the Democrats on that, they, they wait for, for Bedoya. Um, and in terms of the surveillance rule, they can't get that started because the two Republicans oppose that. And um, we, we all should have our close eye on that. The first step will be an advanced notice of public rulemaking, which will be just a series of questions, but the questions could give clues about the direction and the breadth of where they're going. If, if the agency appears to be casting a really wide net with broad bands, um, you know, maybe we won't be able to tell that from the questions, but maybe we will, um, broad bands and activity, that's a sign it's gonna be a long slog with likely litigation at the end. I think maybe as the agency gets closer to actually doing this, they may trim this back and do something that's more manageable, but but we we just really don't know. So we we're I've got my eyes on on Bedoya's arrival and that surveillance rule. And so I think we have time for one more question. So um I'll just ask you both. Um you know, you know, just given everything that we've discussed today, um, how should these developments um, shape how companies and outside counsel engage with the FTC during an investigation? So, Aaron? Uh, so I, I, I think what I've um, counseled previously is that, you know, in times of, of uncertainty and institutional change, um, really focusing on, the fundamentals and and both legally and in terms of agency structure and history, th those all become even more important. I, I, I would say um, so. You know, being familiar with uh, with the process, uh, being able to anticipate um, the legal arguments that that you think will be coming from staff and. Um, uh, um, sort of take into account the different perspectives coming from the top on some of those issues, uh, but, you know, grounding everything in agency precedent um, and, and authority, um, you know, that just becomes all the more important. So, you know, I, I, I think that's kind of the, the general perspective that, that I would offer um, at this point. And I, I think, you know, just to, to reemphasize a point that I made, um, a few minutes ago, we have seen movement in some in the proposal in ways that became a little more flexible or provided more time for compliance. Uh, so I think you know there there is a um, a potential return to be made in engaging in in those proceedings. So I would put add two things to what you just said, um, which is. Um, one thing, and this may change as we move along, is that, as I said earlier, that a lot of direction is coming from the top right now. And so if you're a company that's used to, um, it used to be that there were a lot of incentives to really just working through things with staff and not escalating because you were going to, if things were going to work better if you work, you know, within the system kind of thing. But now, um, there may be more need to 
go through the process, go have your meetings with the Bureau, have your meetings with the commissioners, since we're not quite sure staff um, has the authority to, to negotiate in the way they did in the past. This could change, but, but we've been seeing signs of that. And then also, um, another thing to keep in mind is your, your arguments have to be broader than based on you know, precedent. It used to be you know, people would come in with these charts saying, well, you can't get a civil penalty higher than this because you know, the last 10 cases had these numbers or um, individual liability comparing it to other cases. The commission is trying to turn the page on some of the, they, they think that, that prior commissions have been too soft. And so your arguments can't be just about precedent. They need to be broader than that. And you know, maybe bring in some competition arguments too, since they said they're gonna look at it through both the consumer and, uh, protection and competition lens. Um, so those are just additions to what the excellent points Aaron made that I wanted to make. Sorry, did you have something else, Aaron? No, no, I think that um, that wraps it up. Okay, yeah, and I, I think one important thing before we wrap up um, for our audience is the CLE code, um, which I think Madison has. Yes, so for those interested in receiving CLE credit, the course code is the following number, 3072. Thank you, Madison. Um, and thank you all for joining us um, for this Kelly Dry seminar um, on the FTC. Um, if you'd like to keep up with privacy and advertising legal developments, uh, please check out and subscribe uh, to our AdLaw Access blog and podcast um, available at adlawaccess.com. Um, also, please visit the Advertising and Privacy Law um, Resource Center available at kellydry.com. Great. Um, Thank you, Aaron and Jessica, for all of your insights today. And thank you, Jason, for hosting us. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Thanks. Bye.